issues there, there in the beginning. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, my webinar today on catching big swings and learning about market phases. Uh, I listened a little bit to some of the speakers who went before me. It was all excellent information. So I am actually going to take us back a little bit to more fundamental type stuff. Uh, when I say fundamental, I mean really simplifying it to look at uh, how I look at the markets from a macro view. And that can be, of course, whittled down all the way to a micro view to any particular stock, index, ETF, options, forex, commodities, you name it. So uh, I'm sort of new to the uh, I'm not of your world, so bear with me, but I hopefully will go very, very smoothly for the rest of the time. So I just have to show this. I'm not going to read it, but basically it says that I am not uh, an investment advisor, that uh, I'm not selling any particular instrument, and that trading is a risk. You can lose all your money. So, and you should never trade with money you don't have. That's all pretty obvious, so we'll move right on. So let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I have somewhat of a unique profile in that I started back in the day, I like to say, on the Commodities Exchange in New York. Uh, I worked for Continental Grain and Conti Commodities, and they started me down on the floor as an analyst, which meant that I was watching what was going on in coffee, sugar, and cocoa particularly, and I was talking to, on a squawk box to brokers around the world telling them who was buying, who was selling, when stops were being hit, where the order flow was, etc. And what's interesting about this background is that I came from special education. I was a teacher. I had gone down to the floor with a friend of mine who worked down there. And when I saw what was going on, I just knew that this is where I wanted to be. So I was very lucky and able to get a job with Conti Commodities. And within a year's time, they made me a um, broker. And um, that's about my spe special education. So when I mention a unique profile is that I learn not only about trading and communicating, because I was writing daily analysis, which I continue to do, by the way, um, but I also love to teach. And so throughout my career at trading, I've continued to do work in different levels uh, in special education, particularly in inclusion which means that I became a consultant to many school districts on modifying curriculum to make it accessible for kids of all learning styles. And that's basically in the spirit that I come as a teacher in trading, is trying to keep it to a point where you get the absolute salient points uh, so that those of you who are a beginner or very advanced can get something out of it, looking at it from a very, very simplistic point of view. Um, I have been trading for over 30 years. And currently, I am the Director of Trading Education at Market Gauge. And uh, I am also now, we started a Market Gauge Asset Management Company, and I am a partner in that. So I have a couple of goals here today. One is I want to give you more of a swing trading. I was listening to Andrew talking about day trading, and that's great. And this obviously has been a market that day trading has been extremely profitable, both long and short. But I like to step it back here for this and show you a really fabulous way to learn how to swing trade or to improve your swing trading if you're already swing trading or knowing when not to do it. And with that, giving you the least amount of risk and the most amount of potential. I also, though, want to go through something that I sort of put together this year based called the modern family, which I think is a representation of the macro picture of the market, the best way that I can see it, go through that with you, show you where all those phases are after we learn a little bit about phases, and hopefully help you to make a determination about what you think the future of the market is. Because that's one of the biggest questions I get right now is do you think the market is going up or going down? And that, actually, I will come to later on. So. This is not really something that takes a lot of time. I mean, obviously, I've been doing this for a long time, but the concept of phases is relatively simple, and it doesn't take a long time for you to be able to comprehend and utilize them. So I also like to show this picture um, because this is me as a young lass down on the coffee exchange. And you can see that I am holding uh, a piece of cardboard with point and figure charts wrapped around it. So there's a sample of point and figure charts. 
So there's a couple of reasons why I like to show this slide. Uh, number one is to show my big hair from the 80s. Um, two is to show you that here I was, you know, a young girl, and as I said, a special education teacher. I did not have fancy degrees from Wharton, et cetera, et cetera. I, and I didn't even have any money. I grew up uh, very modestly. My father was a mailman, and uh, I was told to be teacher because that was what women were expected to do at the time. But when I went down there, and this is the advantage, of course, of being young very often, is I didn't think of any of the barriers. I didn't think of anything of I can't. All I thought about was, here I am. I'm going to make the most of it. And I think that was a a really good uh, mindset to have and still a mindset to have is that you can definitely become a part of the investment world on some level with just a modicum of education and of course what's happened I think in the world of technology and education is that it gets very very complicated which is why I like to go back to where I began and that is I use a tactile approach very important in making X's and O's to learn about all of these chart patterns, uh, number one, and number two, to be able to see when things were actually changing in phases. So it's good sometimes to go back and use your hands like I did. Of course, these days, everything is done on a computer. So let's talk about the first secret of catching big swing trades. Now, of course, everybody knows the hackneyed phrase, the trend is your friend, uh, and of course that definitely continues to be true, but what happens when some things are trending, some things aren't, how do you time your way into the market? And this is exactly what I'm going to cover first. So this is really about phases. I have taught this particular webinar many, many, many times, number one. Number two is, is the premise still of most of my swing trading. And number three is that I'm writing a book on this very subject, <clears throat> which will be out sometime next year. And the book is meant for two things. One is for you to be able to identify the phases. And two is not only to be able to identify the phases and possibly even trade off the phases, but more importantly, how do you make life decisions off of those phases. If you want to get involved in a career change or you want to direct your kids into some sort of educational path, what areas of the economy are doing well? That's what all of this is going to show you today. So I like to put some quotes here only because the third thing that I didn't mention about my lessons on the floor was I was down there do it during the golden years. Paul Tudor Jones, um, you know, Steve Sullivan, um, uh, some of the top, top traders in the world, Mark Fisher, were my contemporaries. They were there with me. Okay, I just aged myself. But it was a good age. And, um, and so those people had spent the time helping me grow and learn, and so much so that I became a really good chartist, and then they sought me out for opinion. But also what I learned was that this is an area where it's so good to give to people. I love teaching. Obviously, the gentleman who went before me also loved teaching. And it's amazing how many people in this business uh, will be so appreciate uh, what you do for them, but also how many people out there who are trying to really spread the word. So these are just some quotes of people who have been extremely appreciative that I always like to share and take a yeah. moment to remember that it's so much yeah. about give and take. So let's go into market phases now. So everything in life, and I'm going to see if I can play with the pen here a little bit. Ah, that sort of works. Let's see if there's a better way to do this. All right, so everything in life is cyclical. Everything. It doesn't matter what it is, life to death, the life cycle of a plant, uh, women's cycles, everything that I can think of in life is cyclical, and the markets are certainly no exception. And of course, some of the market cycles are technical, some of them are fundamental, and a lot of it is psychological. And so that's why this all makes tremendous amount of sense to me, because the cycles flow, and it is inevitable that we're going to flow from one cycle to the next. What isn't always so obvious, though, is how long we're going to be in any particular cycle or that it is going to get, be guaranteed to go in a clockwise fashion. 
But for demonstration purposes, let me begin with the bullish cycle. So the bullish cycle is when everything is going well. I'm going to talk about how we determine a bullish cycle momentarily. But things are going great. Everybody's bullish. The market is going straight up. And this is where, whether it's human psychology that comes into play first, or technical factors, or geopolitical factors, or what have you, and certainly we got to see a lot of that play out this year alone in 2015, things start to deteriorate. And as they deteriorate, people start to sell, and we go into a warning phase. Well, then you get all the doomsdayers, and things can go from bad to worse, so we start to go into a distribution phase. And then everything sort of goes to hell in a handbasket, and there we are in a bearish phase. Now, what's so great about the bearish phase, just like with the bullish phase, is that you know with human psychology, we humans happen to be an extremely hopeful group. And so hope starts to set in. Things may start to improve, whether it's economic numbers, geopolitical situation, what have you. And eventually, we go into a period of recovery. From recovery, we go further. The, the, the good vibes start to accumulate, and we go into an accumulation phase. And there we are, back into a bullish phase. So the whole point of this webinar today is for you to be able to pinpoint what phase any instrument is in at any given time. Also take a look at the macro picture of where the phases are either lined up or in division, which is something we've seen a lot of this year. And then be able to make really good trading decisions based on those phases. So the way we determine the phase is very simple. I use two simple moving averages. I use the 50 and the 200. And the 50 and the 200, by the way, I'll just repeat, these are simple moving averages. They're daily moving averages. You can use them on weekly moving averages as well. But for today, we're going to talk about daily. They're not exponential. I do use other moving averages. These are typically the type of questions that I get. But I prefer to use the 50 and the 200 uh, as they seem to be the most reliable. And institutions, by the way, will often look at these two moving averages as well. So in order to determine whether something is in a bullish phase, there are three things that have to happen. The 50 has to be above the 200. So that's the 50, and I don't know how to write this any better. And that's the 200. So one is above the other. The other thing that's extremely important is slope. Those of you who are scientifically inclined know that slope is uh, based on momentum. And so obviously, if a slope is going up, then the momentum is increasing to the upside. If the slope starts to neutralize or go down, even if the 50 is still over the 200, that's information. It tells you perhaps the bullish phase is waning to some degree. And so that's why I'm a huge, huge um, person involved with slope and watching slope. And there are formulas for slope. But you can see them very easily on any chart. And finally, there's price. So the whole idea of price is that you want the price of the instrument you're trading to be above both the 50 and the 200. However, do you want the price all the way up here? It would be nice if you're doing some type of short-term trading. But if you're looking for swing trading, the reason why that would not be a good swing trade is you want the price to be as close to the moving average as possible. This would mean that if you have a price all the way up here and you're just starting to pay attention to something that's in that particular bullish phase, you now have a tremendous amount of risk. So the ideal situation is to have the 50 over the 200, have the price over the 50, and the slopes positive on all. And we're going to look at lots and lots of examples of these things. So let's start with the example of the S&P 500 bear market of 2000, 2009, and how the phases were so clear. Now, before I go through any other um, explanation of this, we talked about the bullish phase being the 50 over the 200, the slope both positive and the price above the 50. Well, the bearish phase is just the opposite. So the green here is the 200. 
and the, the blue line is the 50-day moving average. So in a bearish phase, you have the 50 under the 200, you have the slope negative on both, and you have the price underneath both moving averages. So here we are right at the beginning of 2008. You almost had a perfect, perfect scenario for going short. You had what is known as a death cross. That's when the 50 first crosses back underneath the 200. You had the price trading right underneath. And you had the slope on the 50 starting to go down before the 200, which makes sense because the 200 is over a period of 200 days versus 50 days. The longer the moving averages, the, the longer the period it takes for it to catch up on slope, just like a train. If a train has 50 cars, it takes the conductor of that train much faster to break than if he's lugging 200 cars. So that's how I like to think of it. So you had a very low risk trade to the downside, and that's the whole point of the phases, is that when you have patience and you understand how to identify something that's changing phases or currently in a phase, whether it retraces back to the moving averages or first is starting to break the moving averages, that's when you're going to have the lowest uh, risk possible. So now if we go into time, you can see what happened going into history. We had the big move down. It peaked in the spring of 2009. And then what started to happen was it broke out over the 50-day moving average right around the end of March 2009. And what made this so significant is that while a lot of money people, a lot of investment advisors and brokers, et cetera, were still in post-traumatic stress from this move down, those of us who understood that A, phases cycle, and B, that we can use these simple moving averages, knew that by the time we got into April and the slope was starting to go up, we were getting a recovery phase, eventually getting back into a bullish phase when we had the golden cross, opposite of the bearish cross. And then, of course, you know, the rest is history until this year. So now let me take you about through the modern family for, like I said, two reasons. Um, and by the way, the third line that I didn't talk about on that chart was the 10-day moving average. So I'm really going to focus on the 50 and the 200 in terms of teaching you phases. When I show you some real trades, we'll talk a little bit about that 10-day moving average because I will use that often for uh, making determinations, sometimes for entries, very often for exits. But I want to go back to the modern family for two very important reasons. One is because of this whole idea of phases. Two also is to point out to you that this is what I consider to be the crux, the gem of how we determine what's really going on, particularly in the US economy. And hopefully, this answers a lot of questions for you on where do we think things might wind up as we head into 2016. So I have one index that I use. Now, obviously, uh, we're going to show some charts on this, at what it looks like as of yesterday's close. But the IWM, or the Russell 2000, is my favorite index to watch to gauge what I think is the real picture. Why? Because it's 2,000 small cap stocks. NASDAQ right now made a new weekly high close ever on Friday. IWM, different picture. What does that tell us? Very simple. If we're looking at phases alone, and we'll look at what the phase is on this momentarily, the place to be is in the NASDAQ stocks. In fact, I even heard Andrew talk about that before I went on. And secondly, technology. And you're going to see why. But in terms of the real broad index, the 2,000 small caps, mm, not so much. That doesn't mean the picture couldn't change. Now, there are five sectors of the economy that I think are super important. Retail. Now, if you read my daily, and I'm going to put this actually in the little chat box here. If you go to mish.marketgauge.com, you can sign up for my daily. It's a free daily blog. And you'll see that I have actually named this group that I'm about to talk about, the modern family. So IWM is granddad for obvious reasons. 2,000 stocks, small caps, it's the patriarch. And XRT is grandma. 
Why? Because grandma, without trying to be sexist or anything, pulls the purse strings. It's the retail sector. It's the huge component of the GDP, 70%. So obviously we know the consumer ultimately drives the economy. Now it is interesting, we'll talk about this more a little bit later, that we're seeing a, a division there as well, online shopping like Amazon versus brick and mortar stores. But nonetheless, consumers are important and we want to see where their buying habits are coming from. Then there's transportation, IYT. So if you go back and study the Dow theory from the 1800s, of course, times were a little simpler then when it comes to the markets. But he believed very strongly that unless transportation was also in sync with the overall Dow, that you were definitely not going to see a good, strong economy. And even in this day and age, when things you know, obviously have so many other factors, things still have to move by planes, by trains, and by automobiles and trucks. So that's also extremely important. And now I've added uh, two years ago regional banks, and I've waited a long time. Regional banks are doing extremely well. It's also a great indicator of the expected future of the whole economy. Why? Because if things are moving in regional banks, and I'm not even talking about the big banks so much, although often you'll see them move in tandem, but in the regional banks, it tells you that from the local economies, things are starting to move. Then we have two more which are more speculative. IBB, or biotech, has had a tremendous move up since 2010. And only in this year, and whether you say it was a bubble getting ready to burst, whether or not it was the comments from Hillary Clinton a few months ago saying that pharmaceuticals were gouging prices, whatever it is, from a cycle standpoint, it was definitely inevitable that a run that goes five or six years was about to change. So IBB is actually struggling right now, and I think it's indicative that a lot of the speculative money has gone out of that right now is in all, all the tech stocks. And finally, the one area of the economy besides KRE that is still doing well in terms of my modern family is semiconductors. And by the way, my names for, for regional banks is the prodigal son. IBB is big brother. Semiconductors is just a, another sibling, a male sibling. And so we're seeing semis doing well because it's technology. So it is a good indicator of the health of the overall economy, but not nearly what I can th consider to be as important as, say, retail, transportation, and small cap stocks. So hence, we've got a very confused market right here. So let's take a look at now how it relates with the phases. So I gave you an idea of bullish phase. I gave you an idea of bearish phase. We have to have the lineup of the two moving averages. Um, and so let's talk about what happens when granddad, IWM, pulls back here when everything else is working. So you can see in this particular case, and I'm going to tell you what the gray is blocked out purposely so that we can sort of make a guess of what happens next based on the phases of all of these modern families and how they work together. So you can also make an assumption here that the 200 is underneath each one of these. You can sort of see it sneaking out right there. So you have, um, at that point, retail doing well. Biotech was still rocking and rolling. Semiconductors were doing well, even a little bit better than XRT. IYT was hugging here on the 50-day moving average. And actually, at this point, regional banks were still under the 50. So the question is, what's going to happen? IWM is over the 50. These things are doing well. These three right here, these things are floundering. What do you think is going to happen next? Is this going to pull things down? Or is this going to catch up to the others? And we can see what happens right after, in the next couple of months period, is IWM starts to take off. Sem of course, uh, IBB continues to take off. XRT continues to take off. Semiconductors continue to take off. IYT plays some catch up. And KRE is stubbornly crossing over the 50. And so you can see that they do work in tandem. And this happens over and over and over again. Now, what happened later on was a huge breakout. At that point now, since KRE started to move up, we had the Russells had a big 5% move. 
Uh, biotech actually sort of started to peak out, as did retail. Semis were consolidating. Transportation was consolidating. And KRE was also making its move, too. So in terms of risk factor, the whole point of showing you this, besides really being able to understand how you can trade each instrument for its own uh, worth, is to also understand how long a swing trade you may want to have based on the factors of these other members of the modern family. So had you bought IWM around this 50-day moving average with a very tight risk to the 50 or just underneath, you had a really nice trade. Now, in the same period of time, things started to consolidate. After that 5% move, we went through a period of consolidation. We even broke the 50. Look at how we broke the 50. That would have been a warning phase. If you were long, you probably would have gotten out at that particular point. But it went right immediately back up. So one, what crossed back over the 50-day moving average first was XRT and IWM. What never broke the 50-day moving average during that period was KRE. So you can see how they work in tandem but they also have their own personalities. When they're all working together, that's really, I think, the best indication of when you can be comfortably bullish. And of course, we haven't really seen this scenario since the spring of 2015. So you can see that here, everything is working together. Everything is in a bullish phase. Slopes on all the 50s are up. Even when we broke the 50-day moving average, briefly here and briefly here, the slopes start to go a little negative, but really we went immediately back to positive. So we're going to talk about right now a different time. So everything was going great in the spring. And actually, this period of time, by the way, that I'm showing is the spring of 2015. And you'll see that what happened, things changed very rapidly as we got into the summer of 2015. So here were the warnings before the plunge. And this is, again, meant to show you phases, but also meant to give you what I think is the best view that I know of, of being able to determine for yourself what you think the economy is going to do, and then decide what type of time frame you want to trade it. I'm sticking to swings, but I trade in all time frames. Day trading, mini swing trading, and this is a really good way to help you determine that. So what happened is right here in August, everything now except for biotech, uh, and transportation, interestingly enough, was starting to break the 50-day moving average. Then we started to look at not only was XRT holding the 200, but semiconductors, where all the speculative money had been, was now under the 200. We were just about to get into a bear phase, that 50 crossing below the 200. Biotech still holding on. IWM went down to the 200. KRE was breaking the 50, et cetera. So right before you got all kinds of warnings, you had plenty of warnings using these phases in the modern family to know something was up. And so we saw the big crash, okay? So now this is uh, right to current time, I believe. Hold on, let me just move one more chart. No, this is right before current time. This goes takes you right into the middle of November, December. So you can see now, and this is very, very reflective of what's happening in the market. If you're not in NASDAQ and you're not in technology and you're not in some of the financial stocks, not even all the financial stocks, you've been having trouble and this tells you why. Retail looked terrible. Death cross, bearish phase. You can see that under the 50, under the 200. IBB, death cross at this point was still trying to hold above the 50-day moving average marginally. The Russell 2000's recovery phase, but had the big plunge. Still, to this day, I'll show you momentarily trying to get back over that 200. Semiconductors, different picture. Back above the 200, accumulation. IYT, trying to figure it out. KRE, same thing. Not only back above the 200, but you can see about to have a golden cross. So if we look right now, this is as of Friday's close. As you're going into this week, this is what's so important. NASDAQ, yes. Semiconductors, here we are. We're, just, we're not quite into a golden cross here, but we did very, very well, closing extremely strong, one of the highest closes we've seen since the spring. However, retail, still bearish. IBB, in recovery, 
but also could be forming some kind of a giant bear flag here. If we can't get back over this 200, trouble. Russell's recovery, but not nearly as strong. When you think about the Nasdaq closing on new weekly highs and this one down here, it tells you, is this going to be a predictor of what happens next, or is this going to be dragged along with some of the others? And the only two right now that are showing any pockets of strength are the regional banks and the semiconductors, and of course the semiconductors, and XLK if you want to look at that one too in the technology space, showing a different picture. So that makes me wonder what's going to happen next. I'm keeping my eyes very close here in terms of equities on these six, one sector and five groups to really be able to make a determination. It doesn't mean I wouldn't buy tech stocks, and it doesn't mean that I wouldn't buy banks, but it does mean that I would definitely want to keep an eye on these to see if they're giving me warnings like we saw in August of a plunge possible in the works. We don't know. If these go up, then we can say the worst might be actually over. And it didn't even get that bad. OK, so let's go to number two. So when the phase changes, as I just showed you before, is the most explosive time. This is when the institutions are really getting involved. You start to see big options flow or big buying coming in. Generally, it's when we're starting to see uh, prices go above the 50 or the 200 or below. So now what I'd like to do is I took out, these are all real trades that I have made based on phases. And they're not here to show you how smart I am or to brag or anything like that. They are here because they are real trades that were uh, all documented and really to show you how relatively simple it is to be able to time your way in with very low risk if you're patient and you wait for the phase. Now, you're not seeing the 200 here because the 200 was above. This is junk bonds, which, by the way, have also been completely creamed recently. Um, but I found them to be compelling when they broke over the 50-day moving average. So here's what I'm talking about. The cyan line, by the way, that's my 10-day moving average. So essentially, what we had here was a recovery phase. And when it broke down under the 50-day moving average and then came right back up, I said, wow, I have a good risk right here. Let me take a shot. This thing has been hammered like crazy. And perhaps this recovery phase is going to show some kind of a emerging new trend. So we got long. Now, I use actual targets based on swing trading rules and not only risk, but I also like to use ratios, position size, and we'll talk about that more. But you can see I sold half up here, and then this is where I like to use my 10-day moving average. When it broke the 10, I exited the uh, remaining portion. Now you'll see the name of the slide says nearly 5 ATR. So let me take a, a moment here to explain to you about ATRs. An ATR is an average true Every instrument has a range, a daily range. It's really the personality of that particular instrument. It shows the personality and also the volatility. So something like junk has a very small range, trades only about 15 cent range per day. So when you're doing position sizing or when you're trying to figure out your risk reward, what you want to do is you want to risk maybe one, two times the, tr the, the range of that particular instrument, but you want to make three, four, five, six, and beyond times that in profit. So in this particular case, where I risked uh, a couple of uh, times the range, I actually, on my first profit target, uh, got out at almost five times, and then the rest a little bit less than that. So. It's, uh, it's always good to keep in mind what the range is. If you're trading Apple versus opposed to junk, obviously the range is going to be much different. What that does is it, it changes your position sizing. So now this is Mosaic, another example. Now I happen to personally like, for me, the best thing that I like is the recovery phase. That's just my personal favorite time to trade. Why? Because I think that getting in when things are changing phases from being beat up to a recovery is when you start to see volume really pick up. You're in sort of ahead of the curve. And you can enjoy the profits when everybody else starts getting in. So we got into Mosaic right over the 50. I had a really tight risk under the 50. 
And this doesn't happen every day. I wish it did, of course. But it gapped open over the 200, went immediately into an accumulation phase. I took some profit, took more profit on the way up, probably because of earnings. Uh, in this particular uh, area, some stocks we hold through earnings, some stocks we don't, depending on the service. In this particular service, we don't. And you can see, eventually, it went into a golden cross. So we got in long before that, and we made a lot of money. Russia. Oh, my goodness, Russia. So Russia was another one. Here's that 200. Again, I've been watching Russia. Now, sometimes I may miss the initial move up. Again, if I first start cluing into a chart, and I see it's trading all the way up here in the 50s all the way down here. I'm not going to buy it. But if I see that it's come all the way down to the 50, even penetrated the 50, like I showed you with some of those charts in the modern family, and then comes back through the 50, I may wait a couple of more days, but then I'll get in as long as my risk is within the multiple of what I showed you of the range, which in this case was 45 cents, got in, virtually had no pain. Again, this is another one that took out the 200. I held it. At this point, thought, wow, this is going to really be great. By the time it had its golden cross, though, look at that. I had to exit because it broke the 200. Still made really nice money on that. Now, TAN, solar, anybody who knows me is uh, knows that I am uh, really watching solar energy very carefully. And in fact, my daily, uh, which I gave you the link for, tomorrow when it comes out, is all about solar. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So I really, really, if, if you wanted to know what my number one area for you guys to look at going forward to, to is for swing trading is look in TAN, the ETF itself, and look at some of the solar stocks. I'm personally long right now for solar, but I'm looking to get long this uh, again. But I did it earlier in the year, again, on that recovery phase over the 50. I had a really tight risk. I immediately took some profit uh, based on my parameters. I took more profit once it crossed over the 200. And then I got out after it looked like it was reversing. And I have not actually been in this ETF since, even though there's been a couple of other opportunities. Now I'm extremely excited about it. And I'll tell you before I move on to the next uh, chart that the last two days of this week, Thursday and Friday, TAN, even though it's still under the moving averages currently, had two of the biggest volume days since June of 2014. And of course, with the climate summit and just, you know, the uh, obvious uh, troubles with sticking to uh, crude oil uh, and everything else, I think finally, finally, we may be going into solar's time as a mega trend. And of course, this would be a really good way to play it because this uh, is comprised of a basket of the top solar stocks. All right, let's move on. So KRE, here's my buddy, my prodigal son. Um, and um, I believe that TAN is New York Stock Exchange. I can tell you that in one second, if I put it up on my trade station, uh, ARCX. So um, anyway, let's, let's move on. We'll get to these questions at the end because I don't want to lose my train of thought. So now the prodigal son, I've been watching this too. I, 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 once I get my mind on a trend that I think is emerging, like regional banks uh, or solar energy, and uh, at the end I'll tell you a little bit about my thoughts on some of the commodities, particularly agriculturals, I, do not, I watch it like a hawk. And I wait and I wait and I wait. And what I wait for is exactly what I'm showing you now. I wait for phase change. And if I've missed the phase change, <clears throat> I wait for a correction back to testing the major moving average. And by the way, I just want to repeat, there's nothing else on my chart. That doesn't mean that I don't look at other things. I do. I like Bollinger Bands. I like volume indicators. Um, I like uh, pivots and uh, opening ranges. And this is all the stuff that we do at Market Gauge. But it's so simple if you just look at the simple moving averages. So when KRE looked like it was consolidating and going to hold the 50, I got in, and once again, we caught a really good move. At the time, I was still in the trade. Where, uh, we, were, we got out of that trade long before the crash. Um, and I'm not currently in the trade now, but I'm still really, uh, and that's mostly because of the discrepancy in the modern family. But if I start to see things improve in the rest 
of the sectors, uh, I would not hesitate if the risk was there to get back in. So PBF is another one. Again, uh, this was in a bullish phase. Uh, I liked it because it was an energy stock. It came down. It tested the 50. It held. As soon as we broke out over what looked like some consolidation, I got in. I still had a decent risk because you can see the ATR on this is $1.30. I had a good risk down to about the 50-day moving average. It immediately went up, and I exited the rest of the position. You can see that started to crash, too. Again, very close to the moving averages with a good tight risk. Now, I am going to show you uh, a couple of losses in a moment. But essentially, so I've now showed you that you want to wait for phase changes. You want to see how the slopes are. My particular one is after we've been in a bearish phase and it comes into a recovery. Some people like to just wait for bullish phases. Some, people's a perma, some people are perma-bear and only want to sell warning and distribution in bear phases. It doesn't matter. The whole idea is now you can identify it. And if the slope is going in your favor, the lineup is, uh, is in the phase that makes sense. And the price is close to the there really is at some point. You should be able to figure out that the lowest risk opportunity is either happening right at that moment, based on everything I just, just told you, or the risk is, risk is too great, you missed it, wait for the next opportunity, or wait for some sort of pullback. So once you're in a trade, this is trade management. This is not really what this is about, but I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about it. I showed you that I had targets of the average true range. So once I have two or more times of my uh, average to range in profit, I always like to go immediately to a no-loss stop. This way now, if it goes against me, I'm not going to do what a lot of people do, which is turn a green trade into a red trade. And I want to spend another moment here telling you that human psychology when it comes to trading is so interesting. Because people will sit with losers far longer than they'll sit with winners. It's human psychology. Oh my God, I'm right. How could that possibly be? I better get out before I'm wrong. Whoops. All right, I just, oh, there we are. Okay, thank you. Um, secondly, when you're wrong, everybody gets super hopeful at the wrong time and says, oh my God, I'm wrong, but I know it's going to turn around. I just know it is. I know it is. I know it is. And of course, that's when people get really, really hurt. I mean, a bit, even some of the smartest, richest people. Let's think about Ackman this year. Those of you who have followed the BRX trade, how he kept piling into the stock as it continued to decline. So it doesn't matter whether you're a new trader or a very experienced trader, whether you have a little money or whether you're a billionaire. Everybody has to battle this. So this is a real formula for making sure that you keep the emotions out and you keep logic in. So if you have a multiple of your ATR, you go to a no loss. If it starts to go more in your favor, you then start to trail up your stops. And when you get further multiples, whether it's four multiples, five multiples, six multiples, you can take little pieces off and continue to actually trail up your stop. So when you put on the initial initial position, you want to make sure that you position size so that if it gaps against you the next day, and trust me, that's going to happen, particularly in this type of market, you don't get killed. So you're going to position size so that if it gaps against you, let's say the stock gaps open a half a percent or a percent lower from where you got in, you want to position size so that level of hit doesn't take out your equity. And so basically, I like to use a formula of about a half to 1% of my overall equity at risk on any given trade. So if I have four or five trades on, let's say, I'm never going to lose, if everything goes bad overnight, more than 4 or 5%. So that's why I like to think about that, about a half a percent to 1% max of your overall equity. So if you have 100,000, means you're going to risk 500 on every trade. So you position size for that. So if it gaps, you don't get killed. OK, so here's just another couple examples. And then we're going to show you ones that didn't work. So JetBlue, which, you know, by the way, the airline stocks you know, had a really hot year. I waited for this to correct down to the 50. When it got a little bit more above the 50, because it had some wonky uh, action, so I wanted to be sure. I got in over the 10, used the 50 as a risk, 
and the same thing. I started to use my parameters to take some profits, and then when it broke down, and it was obvious I got out of the rest. So you can see some of these returns have been 9%, 12%, 6%, 5 ATRs. So now this is uh, one that didn't necessarily work so well, but it wasn't a loss. Kihu, Golden Cross. I waited and waited and waited. I finally got in here with a risk to here. I hit my first profit target right away. But I thought, wow, something's wrong. Instead of actually getting out completely, because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, I actually scratched a little bit, uh, made it, sold a little bit of a loss the rest of the position. And then I finally uh, got out once it broke the 50. So sometimes, you know, it's good to, to really watch these moving averages. And if you think something is be behaving erratically, get out and look again. But that's different than getting out because you think that, oh my god, how could I possibly be making money? So I just wanted to show you this because I used the 50 here as maybe a sign that it was going to break. I still waited, though because my risk was all the way down here, and then the next time it broke the 50, I'm like, that's it. This phase isn't going to work out. So here's one where it really didn't work out. This is SodaStream. This is a stock I just love to watch. I have no position on it now, but I just love to watch this stock. Um, <clears throat> so it broke the 50. I got in. Um, again, this was in a recovery phase because the 200 was well up here. I, I didn't get out. Uh, I actually wound up taking a small loss when it didn't look like it wasn't going to go in its favor, but I held on to the other half, and then obviously you can see I sold the other half when it broke the 50. So I lost some money, 1.8%. Compared to the gains, that's nothing. Anybody who tells you they make money all the time is lying. Anybody who tells you that um, they, 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 they have gains of 150 to 200%, and they never tell you about the fact that they can also lose that amount of money because they don't have a formula that they can teach you, like I'm showing you right now, be wary of that. Formulaic trading, position sizing, specific profits and targets, and knowing when to move up stops, these are all extremely important to being a successful trader. And if you have 10 trades on and you lose six times, but you lose only uh, half a percent or a percent of your equity, but when you make, you make 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 percent of your equity, on those four trades that you made, you're going to override your losses. And that's what I'm showing you here. I got into Schlumberger here. I was really excited about it. I waited for the perfect time. Didn't work. I got out. OK, GDX, which, by the way, made a nice move on Friday. Definitely something worth keeping an eye on. But at this point, I got in right over the 50-day moving average. The slope, you can see, was starting to neutralize. Again, my particular favorite time to get into a trade, caught this big move up, kept a tail, and got out of the tail once it really started to break down under that 10-day moving average. And you know with these uh, minor stocks, they do that. They make vicious moves up and then mo vicious moves down. Now, sugar, which is a really nice segue into commodities. This is the ETF for sugar. It's not the most actively traded ETF in the world. In fact, a lot of the commodities aren't. But if you don't have a futures account, at least there are ETFs for you to be able to watch some of the soft commodities. Sugar had uh, some big news. I got in before the news was even out about ethanol usage and they're using sugar, uh, increasing the ethanol production. And so when it came over the 50, I got in. Now in this case, I will tell you that I risked a little bit more. I risked down to this low right here. Why? Because these ETFs, they have, this one has a volume average of about, oh, not very much. Not very much at all. In fact, let me tell you, SGG has an average volume of about 65,000 shares a day. Nothing. So when you're trading something that thin, then you really want to risk to a, a, a chart point in this case. So I didn't just wait for it to break the 50. I wanted to see this. And guess what? It came right back. I started to take the profit. I exited the rest. And actually, there was a re-entry. And now sugar is trading up here. So I will tell you, keep an eye on sugar. Keep your eye on coffee. Keep your eye on cocoa. Keep your eye on corn, cotton, all those agriculturals. They're all starting to change phases. OK, so I hope that this was uh, good information to show you that um, when the market is showing you 
that is, everything's working in tandem, of course that's your easiest time to trade. If you're looking at things individually, that's perfectly okay, but wait to see when the phase is changing or when it's coming back to test that phase change for your best entry, your lowest risk. And if you get into a trade and it's doing well, scale yourself out using specific targets. Like I said, try to keep in mind what the range is of that particular instrument. Use multiples of that range. And then also stick with the trend and trail up your stops. OK. So even if you have a small account, you can do this. I would say probably anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000 is enough for you to start making some trades. Obviously, your position size is going to be much smaller because you don't want to lose that $2,000 in one trade. Remember, you only want to lose a percent of that max, if you're wrong, a couple of hundred dollars. So I would say rather than think about how much money you should trade with, think about how much percentage of that money you're willing to lose on any given trade. And if you're catching it right, you're actually going to start to see that build up and you'll start to go from 2,000 to 5,000, hopefully to 10,000 and more. That's how I started, by the way. I borrowed $2,000 to make my first trade in sugar uh, back on the commodities exchange. And I spent 12 years on the floor, paid that 2,000 back right away and had a really good career from there on. So there is more to this, obviously. This is very simple. I think actually so dynamic, though, that I feel compelled to mention this. But I think it's also really good, especially those of you who are new, to uh, be able to get in just on phase changes. But there are other ways to improve as you get more experience. There are specific patterns that I look at to make a trade. I know where to place my stops based on those parameters that I shared a little bit about with you. I know where to place my targets that I shared a little bit about with you. I know how to move my stops, formulaic. I know when to focus on an ETF, uh, especially looking at the different sectors of the economy or commodities, versus when to look at individual stocks. This has been more of a stock picker's market right now. I know how to position size. I can't tell you how important that is. Um, if you want to know more about position sizing, uh, Van Tharp is the master on that. And then once you're in a position, managing positions is key. People know how to get in, people know how to get out potentially, but they don't know how to manage. That is so important and that comes with a lot of experience. Okay, so everybody can have confidence and then the market crashes or it takes off without you. My favorite thing that I have been seeing right now on Twitter is FOMO, fear of missing out. Never have that fear. Watch, say, gee, Mish just told me that if it's too far from the 50, my risk is too great. Unless I'm doing a day trade, I don't want to sit there in case things get screwed up and move down. Let me just find out what another something is that looks a lot better, that has a much saner risk. This is the hunt that I do everything, every day. So now I just, um, yes, 98% lose money. That's absolutely right. Why? Because they have no clue of what they're doing and they think it's easy. You know what's so amazing to me is that no matter what trade you want to go into in life, you have to have education, on-the-job training, be an apprentice, whether you want to be a plumber, certainly a doctor, an electrician, but yet everybody thinks that they're somehow entitled to make money trading the market. And that is the biggest fallacy going. And that's why, you know, at MarketGage, we've spent so much time teaching not only how to identify phases and swing trades, but we also do every type of time frame there is, but how to have actual rules to follow. And if somebody can't give you a rule that's repeatable and that you can use uh, and show somebody else to do, then you know you're going to probably be one of those 98%. And yes, you know, if you're going to lose some money, uh, in fact, when I first made my first trade, Paul, in sugar, the, um, the brokers around me who had been there for a long time all congratulated me because they said, if your first trade's a loser, that's good luck. Why? Because hopefully it's taught you some lessons. It certainly taught me some lessons. And, uh, and so I think that um, you can make money 
uh, and, and I have made money, and a lot of the people who have been with me for years have made uh, money, and so it's really just a matter of, like you said before, patience and taking the emotions out of it, following the overall trend, identifying the phase, knowing what your least amount of risk is, and if you're wrong, get out look again. If you're active, you know there's opportunities every single day. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about, um, you know, one of the things that we do, it's an introductory service, it's called Mish's Market Minute Advantage. Uh, so basically you become uh, one of my subscribers for a year. Uh, with that, uh, you get a fast track to profitable swing trading. It's a streaming video, you get a lifetime of access to this. Uh, and basically, a lot of the stuff that I just talked about, I talk about in this course. And so you talk, I talk specifically about opening ranges, timing your entries, uh, multiples of ATRs, how to get out, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, the biggest Achilles heel is incorrect position sizing. So that's why if you buy too much, um, then and it's a loser, you can get killed. But if you buy too little and it goes up, you don't even make that much money. Position sizing, again, most important. So that's a lot of what I do. I model the trades for you. So let me tell you a little bit here about what Advantage is. I have a model portfolio that, that I put every trade out. You get a text and you get an email. The, everything is explained. We have special gauges that we use so you know the phase, the reason for the trade, the stops, the targets. It's excellent if you're an options trader because in that options you are able to um, be able to see exactly what your strike price should be uh, and what your target should be and you can pretty much tell that I'm looking at things in a certain period of time, usually pretty fast. I'm not looking to carry things for six months to a year, more like anything from a week to a month. Um, and so I put out the trade. I also do a videos every week that are educational videos. I give recommendations outside of it. I do a special email on top of the one that goes out for free with a, a, to subscribers of trading recommendations on top of the ones that we actually do to model. And uh, also that fast track course and a position sizing tool. So if everything I just told you say, well, gee, do I really have to sit there and go, hmm, a half a percent of what I've got, which is really an odd number like $12,500, gee, I don't really know how much to buy based on what you're telling me to risk. This tool, you plug it in and it tells you exactly based on how much money you have and how much you're willing to risk cash, how many, uh, how many shares you should buy or sell. So all of this for one year plus email access to me, ability to talk to me, um, is 497 a year. And if you're interested in finding out more about it, I'm going to put the link here because you can't click on the slide link, marketgage.com forward slash MMM advantage. We're saying right now that it's only 25 traders. The reason for that is because usually when you come into the service, there's some getting up to speed and it requires uh, some customer support. And so we find that if we have 25 people who are coming in at a time, it's manageable to give you the best help that you need in order to get started. And like I said, I'm very amenable. Our customer service department is fantastic, but I'm also very amenable to helping you out and answering questions. So, um, that's really basically it. Is there any questions for me that I haven't already answered because I may have not seen them as I was looking at the presentation as opposed to the chat box? I'm happy to give you any, uh, if any, I, I know that um, you've had some of the other presenters today give you some stock tips or give you some information. I can't show my screen right now. I think it will take too long for me to figure out how to get my trade station up there, but I can certainly show you and tell you. Uh, and if not, I'll just say, well, great. Uh, no questions means uh, that hopefully I did a very good job. And uh, you can see now that, um, yes, you can use these same rules and system on a five-minute chart. You know, the important thing, you, is consistency. If you're going to use a different time frame other than a 50 and a 200, or whether you're going to use exponentials, if you like a 30-day moving average or a 20-day moving average, if you want to do this with weeklies, it's all fine. The actual six phases that I described to you 
are consistent no matter what you're trading. And you can also identify, you can call them something else, but you can identify those same switches of phases no matter what you're using as long as you use it consistently. It's a fractal is really the best way to describe it. So you use 8, 20, and 50 to day trade on a five minute, fantastic. If you're not familiar with our five minute opening range, then you may want to take a look at that in market gauge because that's extremely helpful. It's very specific on when to buy or sell five minute opening ranges, what type of risk you should use, what type of time confirmations you should use, and what type of targets you're using for profits. The color line on the 50 day moving average was blue. The green was uh, the 200. Um, and futures, yes, definitely. Don't forget, Shannon, I cut my teeth in futures. In fact, all of us, Jeff Bish and Keith Schneider, who are uh, the president and CEO of Market Gauge, and myself, we all met on the floor. So a lot of the opening range comes from the theory from the floor when they used to open up futures month by month and then reopen. And a lot of the phases come from, believe it or not, commodity perspective charts that I used to have to hand draw high, low, close. Boy, I'm really sounding like a dinosaur now. And I would get a sense of the phases and then I started using the simple moving averages. Thank you, JB, for sharing the Van Tharp. He is the master on position sizing. There's a link there. I suggest you read him. Um, the color line of the 200 was green. Um, do I recommend that you read about position sizing? Absolutely. Or join me, uh, as I just showed you in the service, and I will help you with position sizing because I talk a lot about it. The moving averages are simple, not exponential, that I showed you. Um, Elliott Wave, interesting you should say that. You know, I think Elliott Wave has uh, credibility used with certain other factors. I myself, I'm not an Elliott Wave person. I have referred to them on occasion. Um, however, you know, I think that if you use it consistently and that's what you're a fan of and it's working for you, if you wanted to layer in anything else with that, layer in phases because that's only going to make your Elliott Wave uh, analysis even more accurate. Um, yes, Van Tharp is the name of the person. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know anything about Gottlieb patterns. Um, and now, did I, I think somebody asked me to look at a specific stock, YM and FDAX. Let me see if I can put that up real quick. Again, I apologize that you cannot sh see my charts with me. Um, no, I'm not getting YM, FDAX. Uh, for some reason, I'm unable to get either one of those. Oil, though, that I know. Okay, very interesting about oil. If you look at the oil chart, um, USO is what I'm looking at, uh, Victor. If you look at the oil chart right now, you can see that we broke and made a new 2015 low on Friday, but we closed back above it with a doji day and huge volume. So there is definitely right now you know, the people are, the, the whole OPEC just voted that they were going to keep production the same. But keep an eye on any type of rising demand. And this is exactly what my whole theme about commodities has been. When we're counter cyclical to stocks, it becomes the day of commodities. When consumption starts to go up, it's just a simple supply and demand. So right now, oil is beat up. It's ripe for a possible move up. However, watch those volume patterns. Watch those phases. Why bother to try to anticipate? Wait for USO to take out the 50-day moving average. Do exactly what I just showed you. If the slope starts to accelerate, you can add to your position. If the slope goes nowhere and it flounders, make sure you have a tight stop. If it starts to move in your direction and you're happy with the position size, keep an eye on it when it gets to the, to the 200. So anyway, that's pretty much it. I think a natural gas, oh my god, that's been so beat up. You're going to have to wait for some sort of uh, a signal there. Um, we do not have a money back policy, no. We do not with this. It's a year. You get a lot out of it from a year. And uh, it takes about a year to really be able to see how the progression of the trades are and the phases. Um, Gold, oh yes, Goldman says $20 a barrel. Forget what anybody says. Make your own determination. That is the whole point of this. Forget about talking heads. Forget about all that stuff. Don't listen to anybody. Go and put up a chart, put up a 50, put up a 200 and say, gee, is it working? Isn't it working? If it's over the 50, I have a chance. If it's under the 50, it still looks weak. 
If it moves up to the 50 and fails it, you got a good short risk too, by the way. I didn't talk much about shorts, but this works very well with shorts as it does with longs. This way, you don't have to depend on anybody. And watch that modern family. Right now, modern family is suggesting that if we cannot see transportation, biotechnology, and uh, retail move up with the regional banks and the technology and semiconductor areas, be careful. Definitely be careful. That doesn't mean you shouldn't trade those hot stocks and those hot areas, but it means that you definitely want to keep in mind that a buy and hold may not necessarily be the best if you're first getting into the game. Okay, so yes, thank you uh, for putting up that link again. And um, we're going to wrap up here. I want to thank you so much. Uh, for listening. Uh, I'm just going to say TAN was the solar ETF. Keep an eye on that. And you all, meanwhile, have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you, CTU, for hosting me. And I hope to see some of you uh, in the service. Let me know if you were here today and you signed up. Send me an email and I'll be happy to, to learn more about you. Okay, thank you.